Good evening and thank you for joining us for this webinar, which is the third in a series of four that we're conducting delivered on the subject of co-occurring substance use and mental health conditions. Um, and these webinars have been funded by the Central and Eastern Sydney Primary Health Network. My name is Catherine Mills. I'm an Associate Professor and Director of Treatment Research for the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of New South Wales. And I have the pleasure of facilitating this webinar, which will be presented by Dr. Christina Morell. I'd firstly like to begin though by acknowledging the Gadigal and Bidjigal people, who are the traditional custodians of this land, and pay my respects to elders both past and present, and also extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's been an exciting series where we have four webinars. The first one gave uh, an overview of co-occurring mental and substance use disorders. The second one focused more on how you identify these co-occurring conditions. And now this third one is uh, focusing on the management and treatment of co-occurring mental and substance use disorders. Um, and then our last webinar, which will be on the 5th of December, will focus on physical health among people with co-occurring substance use and mental health conditions. And if you happen to have missed any of these webinars, you can download uh, both the video and the handouts from our CREMS website, which is comorbidity.edu.au. And on that site, you'll also find links to other webinars um, for clinicians, but also for members of the community, parents, teachers, um, on topics that are related to substance use and mental health conditions and their prevention and treatment as well. Um, just before I begin, I wanted to draw your attention to the Q&A button on your screen. Please feel free to um, post any questions or comments that you have throughout the webinar on there at any point. We'll have about 10 minutes um, at the end of Christina's talk where we'll go through those and have some discussion. And if you experience any technical issues um, during the presentation, you can contact the technical support number on the screen there and quote the um, webinar ID, or you can also go to the um, Zoom help page online and chat with someone there. And I'll put these details up on the chat um, section, uh, which you'll be able to see so that you can refer back to those anytime if you need to during the presentation. And then uh, just lastly, again, we are recording this webinar too. So if you'd like to view it again uh, or download the slides and handouts, you can do that. Um, we'll put them up shortly after this presentation tonight. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Christina Morell. Uh, she's a research fellow at the Centre of Research Excellence in Mental Health and Substance Use at the University of New South Wales. Um, and her research aims to improve our understanding of co-occurring mental and substance use disorders and how to improve our treatment responses, particularly for population groups where there's um, particular multiple and complex needs that often require multiple um, and long-term health and social service responses. Um, Dr. Murrell's work is built on very strong collaborations with clinicians, consumers, carers, and other key stakeholders. Um, and a very big part of her work is on translating the research findings into evidence-based resources for both clinicians and the community. But thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Kath. And thanks so much for joining us for this webinar today. So as Kath said, the focus on the webinar um, tonight is really on managing and treating co-occurring mental and substance use disorders. So although, as Kath mentioned, um, tonight's webinar is the third in a series of four webinars on addressing co-occurring substance use and mental disorders. You don't need to have attended all four. Our intention is really to provide enough information that each of these can stand alone. So if you're interested in um, just knowing more about managing and treating comorbidity, for example, you can come along to tonight's webinar. So there will be a little bit of overlap between um, each topic that we're doing. So as with the first webinar that we presented a few weeks ago, a lot of the material I'll be talking about today will be drawing directly uh, on the second edition of the National Comorbidity Guidelines, which are more formally known as the uh, Guidelines on the Management of Co-Occurring Alcohol and Other Drug and Mental Health Conditions in Alcohol and Other Drug Treatment Settings. And if you're interested in this resource, it can be accessed here. Um, if you're worried that you can't click on these links throughout the live recording, don't worry. Uh, at the end of this webinar, we'll be making this presentation into a downloadable handout. So all of the links that I'll be referring to throughout the presentation will be live or clickable. So hold on. 
So before we get started, I wanted to quickly run through the learning outcomes of tonight's webinar, which are to have a better understanding of the current approaches to managing and treating comorbidity involving other services, have an improved understanding of the need to address lifestyle factors and work within a holistic health approach, as well as have an improved understanding of referral pathways and some techniques to facilitate referrals. So in terms of what we'll be covering in the webinar tonight, I'm going to start with a brief overview of what we know about comorbidity, followed by what we do once we've identified comorbidity in terms of management and treatment within a holistic healthcare approach. I'll also talk a little bit about referral pathways and techniques to facilitate referrals. But before doing that, I want to start by introducing you to Michelle. She's an 18-year-old female who presented to a local drop-in um, medical service after being beaten up by her boyfriend. She's, she's currently staying with friends. She has an extensive trauma history beginning when she was 11 years old, when she was abused by a family member. The ongoing abuse led to Michelle leaving home when she was 14 years old, and until the recent assault, she'd been living with her boyfriend, Andy. Andy introduced Michelle to heroin around 12 months ago, and he was emotionally and physically abusive throughout the relationship. Although Michelle had been badly injured during the assault, she insisted that her friends not take her to hospital because she was afraid she'd be um, in trouble uh, uh, for the drugs that she had in her system. But her friends eventually persuaded her to see a doctor or a nurse at the local drop-in centre. And of course, this is just one way in which a person with comorbidity might present to services. There are lots of different presentations. But if somebody with Michelle's presentation does come into contact with services, what are the next steps? And I'd just like you to try and keep these few brief facts that I've said about Michelle um, in your minds as we progress. I'll be coming back to Michelle as we move through the process of management and treatment of comorbidity. Now, first challenge is to consider Michelle's presenting issues and in doing so, consider them within the broader context of what we know about comorbidity. And before doing that, I just want to clarify what I mean when I'm talking about comorbidity. So broadly defined, comorbidity refers to the co-occurrence, either lifetime or current, or of two or more disorders. And our focus today is on the co-occurrence of alcohol or other drug, or AOD, and mental health disorders or conditions. There are, of course, many other types of comorbidities. We also know that comorbidity is common. Mental and substance use disorders are two of Australia's most common and burdensome health conditions. They affect around one in five Australian adults each year, and they frequently co-occur. It's estimated that around one in three Australians with a substance use disorder also have a mental health disorder, but this rate can be as high as around 75% among people who are seeking treatment. In terms of the most common mental health conditions that we see to co-occur with substance use disorders, these are typically the same as those that we see in the general population, which are anxiety and depression, PTSD and personality disorders, but we also see elevated rates of bipolar disorder, psychosis, ADHD or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder and Eating Disorders. And the fact that these disorders co-occur is problematic because once they're established, each serves to maintain and exacerbate the other. There are also a lot of people who experience symptoms of their disorders, but they don't necessarily meet the criteria for a diagnosis of a disorder. And this means that a lot of people could have their lives disrupted by symptoms of their mental health disorders, but without meeting the diagnostic criteria for a mental health disorder, they tend to fly under the radar of some services. So rather than thinking about mental health as merely the presence or the absence of a disorder, it can be quite useful to think of uh, mental health conditions as existing on a continuum, which range from mild symptoms, mild symptoms, such as mild depression on one end, to severe disorders such as um, schizophrenia or psychotic or suicidal idea, uh, sorry, suicidal depression on the other end. The prevalence of mental health disorders can also vary between substances, but there's been little research conducted which compares the rates of mental health disorders across different types of AOD use disorders. So there's not a lot of information available to help guide health practitioners in this sense. Substance use among people with mental health disorders tends to mirror the general population trends in terms of availability and fashion, and the most commonly used substances in the general population are tobacco and alcohol, followed by smaller proportions who use illicit substances. In general, few, peer, few people who experience these conditions access treatment, in part because they have a lot of difficulty accessing services and because of the stigma that they're often faced with when they do. So an estimated 1 in 10 people with a substance use disorder alone seek treatment, but when you have substance use, mood and anxiety, this rate increases to around 70 to 80%, which indicates that mental health or the complexities that accompany comorbidity might be a driver into treatment. 
but even among those who do manage to access treatment, there's often an incredibly lengthy delay between the time when they, just, when they first start to develop symptoms and when they eventually make treatment contact. So the evidence tells us that the median delay among people with alcohol use disorders who eventually make treatment contacts in Australia is 18 years. A large part of the problem in people being able to access treatment is that our clinical services, and particularly those for comorbidity, have traditionally adopted a siloed approach in which mental and substance use disorders are treated separately. So as a consequence, people can be bounced between mental health and AOD services with little continuity or coordination of care, and a lot of people can end up falling between the cracks in the healthcare system. Comorbidity is a problem because not only do people with um, comorbidity experience symptoms of their mental health and their substance use disorders, but they also have complex presentations and this can complicate their treatment and recovery. And research has shown that people with mental or substance use disorders die an astonishing 20 to 30 years earlier than the general population and spend the last 10 years of life living with disabling chronic illnesses. So the key points to take so far are that comorbidity is common and can complicate a person's treatment and recovery. Once comorbid conditions have been established, it's most likely the relationship between them is one of mutual influence and a number of barriers can make it quite difficult for people with comorbidity to receive effective treatment. So I'm gonna move on to the next topic of the webinar, which is what do we do once comorbidity has been identified? And I'll be talking about what to do in terms of the management of symptoms, as well as the treatment of comorbidity within a holistic healthcare approach. So first of all, managing comorbidity. The first thing I wanna say about management is that it's quite different to treatment. So the goal of managing mental health conditions is to allow treatment to continue with minimal disruption or dropout. So there, there are some management strategies in the guidelines, which I mentioned before, and these provide short-term relief and control over symptoms. And this is an interim measure during treatment until full treatment for comorbid problems is possible. But without further treatment, these techniques on their own um, may not provide long-term relief from symptoms. The guidelines also provide some do's and don'ts and practical strategies for managing some of the commonly co-occurring disorders. There are various ways to effectively manage mental health symptoms. And one advantage of these management techniques is that no diagnosis is required prior to their use. So in other words, the symptoms are being managed rather than disorders being treated. So in the next few slides, I'm gonna talk about managing symptoms of depression and anxiety, bipolar disorder, trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder, grief and loss, psychosis, personality disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD and eating disorders. I'll also be talking about these same disorders when we get to the treatment of comorbidity. There's a lot to cover. If, um, if I go too fast or if I speak too quickly, you can download the recording or access the handouts at the end of the webinar and I'm very sorry in advance. So first of all, I'm gonna be talking about managing symptoms of depression and or anxiety. So negative mood is often a trigger for relapse and therefore addressing depressive symptoms is a really important part of relapse prevention. Many depressive and anxiety symptoms will subside after a period of abstinence and stabilization and it can be quite useful to explain to clients that it's relatively normal to feel depressed or anxious when they enter treatment but that these feelings will usually improve over a period of weeks. During and after this time, constant monitoring of symptoms will allow the clinician to determine whether further treatment for these symptoms is needed. For clients with independent depressive disorders as opposed to substance-induced disorders, it's unlikely that their depressive or anxiety symptoms will, will resolve completely with abstinence. These symptoms might even get worse. Um, so in these cases, clients should be assessed for a depressive disorder and further treatment options considered. So there are several simple strategies which are based on cognitive behaviour therapy or CBT, which can be useful and effective in managing clients with depressive or anxiety symptoms, including, cog including cognitive restructuring, pleasure and mastery event scheduling, goal setting and problem solving. So I'll go through these briefly. Um, I just wanted to also say that more guidance for clinicians on how to implement these techniques and also some handouts that can be provided to clients can be found through the link that I have there on screen. So cognitive restructuring is a really useful method for controlling symptoms of depression and anxiety, and it's based on the belief that what causes these feelings isn't the situation itself, but rather the interpretation of the situation. So the idea is that feelings and behaviours of anxiety, depression and relapse, etc., are the results of negatives, um, sorry, negative thoughts and beliefs that can be modified. 
So in this model, there's an initial event, which leads to automatic thoughts or beliefs about the event. And these thoughts have resulting feelings and behaviours or consequences. Because these thoughts are automatic and often negative, they're rarely based on any real world evidence. But it's, um, so it's therefore really important to look for supporting or disproving evidence that can dispute their automatic thoughts. So rather than feeling hopeless about trying to control any situation which occurs, which is just about impossible, a better approach is to learn how to control our reaction to these events. And this can then have a flow on effect to our feelings and behaviours. A simple process of recognition and modification of these thoughts and beliefs can be conducted with clients using the A to E model that I have here on screen. Some common negative automatic thoughts and beliefs which can be challenged by using cognitive restructuring exercises include overgeneralization or the expectation that just because something's failed once that it always will. So for example, thoughts like, I tried to give up once before and I relapsed, I'll never be able to give up. Catastrophizing or exaggerating the impact of events and imagining the worst case scenario. For example, thinking things like, I had an argument with my friend, now they hate me and are never going to want to see me again. All or none or black and white thinking. For example, if I partly fail, it means I'm a total failure. Thinking in terms of shoulds, oughts and musts. So this type of thinking can result in feelings of guilt, shame and failure. For example, thinking things like I must always be on time. And personalising, which is when some people frequently blame themselves for any unpleasant event and take a lot of responsibility for the feelings and behaviours of others. So for example, it's all my fault that my boyfriend's angry, I must have done something wrong. So the cognitive restructuring worksheet that I have here on screen can be quite a useful resource in terms of identifying and challenging negative thoughts. And it can be uh, found by the link that I had on screen a few slides earlier. Structured problem solving is also a useful way of managing depressive and anxiety symptoms, as these symptoms are often the result of an inability or a perceived inability to deal effectively with problems. Some simple steps to assist the client include identifying the problem and defining it, Stepping back from the problem, brainstorming possible solutions, thinking about each solution in practical terms, and evaluating the pros and cons, deciding on the best solution, putting the solution into action, and then evaluating how effective it was, and whether or not it can be improved. Goal setting is also a useful strategy to help clients with both AOD treatment as well as depression and anxiety symptom management. So it allows the client to experience feelings of control and success, and this can counter some common feelings of hopelessness and worthlessness. Goal setting also ensures that therapy remains client focused, which can increase motivation and help the therapists um, figure out what the client's central concerns are. So goals should be geared toward the client's level of motivation and concern, be negotiated between the client and clinician, be specific and achievable, be based on process rather than outcome, be short term, and be described in positive rather than negative terms. So for example, the goal to decrease anxiety at parties is expressed in a negative way. The same goal expressed in a positive way would be, I will try to relax and enjoy myself at parties. People with depressive symptoms often stop engaging in behaviors that give them a sense of pleasure and achievement. So this can lead to a cycle where they become really inactive, which can then lead to more negative um, feelings and lower mood and energy, which can then lead to even less engagement in activities and so on. So pleasure and mastery event scheduling is a behavioural technique that helps clients engage in activities that gives them a sense of pleasure and achievement in a structured way. This strategy is a weekly timetable in which clients can schedule particular activities. And it's really important for clients to start with activities that are simple and achievable. So again, I've got a link to worksheets that clients can complete on screen there. And this also includes a list of possible starting points, maybe for inspiration. Relaxation techniques are also um, a useful way to manage the distressing and distracting symptoms, symptoms of anxiety. So some useful relaxation methods include progressive muscle relaxation, controlled or abdominal breathing, calming response, visualization and imagery, grounding, sorry, and grounding. Um, each method works best if it's practiced daily by clients for 10 to 20 minutes. But again, not every technique will work for everybody. And more detail about these can um, be found on the link on screen there. So I've got some techniques um, up here that can help workers manage depressive symptoms. Um, and I'll do this across all of the disorders that we'll be talking about today. So you can go through them in the handouts at the end of the webinar, but I won't be able to go through them now. Um, so here are some do's and don'ts for managing depressive symptoms, as I said, uh, and the same for managing symptoms of anxiety. 
So I'm going to move on to managing symptoms of bipolar disorder. It can be particularly challenging to treat people with bipolar disorder due to the broad range of emotions experienced, which can impact on the relationship between the client and the therapist. So depending on which phase of the disorder that the client is in, they might present with either symptoms of depression or mania hypermania. If the person is in between episodes, they can appear to be completely well. People with bipolar disorder predominantly present to services during the depressive phases of the disorder rather than during the periods of elation. If experiencing a depressive episode, the client can present with depressive symptoms, which I mentioned before. And when experiencing mania hypermania, a client's mood is persistently elevated and symptoms of grandiosity, flight of ideas, hyperactivity, decreased sleep, psychomotor agitation, talkativeness and distractibility may be present. Mania and hypermania can lead to a loss of insight and this can place a per the person at increased risk um, and impact negatively on medication compliance. So in general, if the client presents during a depressive episode, management of symptoms should really follow the guidelines for the management of depressive symptoms, which I talked about a little earlier. And as I also mentioned when talking about the management of depressive symptoms, negative mood is often a trigger for relapse to AOD use, so addressing depressive symptoms is an important component of relapse prevention. But if the client's experiencing a manic episode or symptoms of psychosis, consultation with a medical practitioner is recommended. Some clients might be aware they're unwell and will voluntarily seek help. Others may lack insight into their symptoms and refuse help. In some instances, a person's manic symptoms can put both the client and others at risk of harm. And in these circumstances, mental health services should be contacted whether the person um, wants that referral to be made or not. So again, some techniques that can help workers manage clients with depressive symptoms of bipolar are here for you to come back to later as well as some techniques that can help workers manage clients experiencing mania and hypermania. So I'm going to move on to managing trauma-related symptoms. So following exposure to a traumatic event, a person may experience symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, such as recurrent re-experiencing of the traumatic event through nightmares, flashbacks, and intrusive memories, persistent avoidance of thoughts, reminders, or situations which are associated with the trauma, and a general numbing of emotional responsiveness, or persistent symptoms of increased psychological arousal, including hypervigilance towards distressing cues, sleep difficulties, exaggerated startle response, and increased anger and concentration difficulties. So it's quite common for the frequency of trauma-related symptoms to increase when a person stops drinking or using substances. And this is um, usually because clients often use these substances to suppress these feelings and control traumatic thoughts. But it's really important to note that avoidance th symptoms rather than re-experiencing symptoms have been associated with the perpetuation of trauma-related symptoms. So it's really crucial that if a person does become upset due to their traumatic thoughts, that they're not encouraged to avoid or suppress their thoughts or feelings. So telling a person not to think or talk about what's happened can intensify their feelings of guilt or shame. Again, some techniques for managing trauma-related symptoms are here for you to come back to. There's also a multitude of different sources of grief and loss, and clients with comorbidity are often highly likely to experience these emotions for various reasons, including traumatic experiences, having lost partners, family members, or friends as a result of AOD use, and the feelings of loss for those in treatment, which can be associated with the heavy role AOD use has played in clients' lives. So the main issue in grief management is really to normalise the process for clients by encouraging and supporting the grieving process and reminding the client that this process is natural. Everyone deals with grief and loss differently, and of course, not all approaches are going to suit everybody. Some techniques for managing symptoms of grief and loss are here for you to come back to. And I'm going to move on to managing symptoms of psychosis. Acute psychosis represents one of the most severe and complex presentations. So during an acute psychotic, sorry, acute episode of psychosis, a person's behavior is likely to be disruptive and or peculiar. Psychotic symptoms include delusions, which are false beliefs that usually involve the misinterpretations of perceptions or experiences, hallucinations or false perceptions such as seeing, hearing, um, smelling, sensing or tasting things that others can't, disorganized speech or illogical, disconnected or incoherent speech, disorganized thought or difficulties in goal direction which impair daily life, catatonic behavior or a decrease in reactivity to the environment, 
rapid or extreme mood swings, or behavior that's unpredictable or erratic, so often in response to delusions or hallucinations. For example, shouting in response to voices or whispering. It's quite common for people to present to AOD settings with subacute psychosis, particularly as a result of methamphetamine use. A range of low-grade psychotic symptoms can be displayed, including increased agitation, severe sleep disturbance, mood swings, a distorted sense of self, others, or the world, suspiciousness, guardedness, fear, or paranoia, odd or overvalued ideas, illusions and or fl fleeting low-level hallucinations, or erratic behaviour. And again, some techniques that can help workers manage symptoms of psychosis are here to come back to. And as with bipolar disorder, some clients may be aware that they're unwell and will voluntarily seek help, and others may lack insight into their symptoms and refuse help. Active phase psychosis can put both the client and others at risk of harm, and therefore mental health services should be contacted whether the client wants that referral to be made or not. And it should also be remembered that there's a lot of stigma and discrimination associated with both psychotic spectrum disorders and AOD use, and some people may attempt to conceal either one or both of their conditions. Many people with comorbid psychosis and AOD use are frightened of being imprisoned, forcibly medicated, or having their children removed. So taking the time to really engage the person and develop a respectful, non-judgmental relationship with hope and optimism is really important. Use a direct approach, but be flexible and motivational. Should also be noted that some clients with psychotic disorders may present to treatment when they're stable on antipsychotic medication and may not be displaying any active symptoms. And these clients should be encouraged to continue taking their medication as prescribed and ensure that they receive an adequate diet, relaxation and sleep because stress can trigger some psychotic symptoms. Despite the risk of further psychotic episodes, some people can choose to keep using substances that may induce psychosis. And in these cases, the following strategies can be helpful. Um, so let the client know about reverse tolerance. And this is when it, this is an increased sensitivity to the drug, to a drug after a period of abstinence, as well as the increased chance of future psychotic episodes. Encourage the client to avoid high doses of drugs and riskier administration methods. Encourage the client to take regular breaks from using and to avoid using multiple drugs. Teach the client to recognize early warning signs that psychotic symptoms might be returning. For example, feeling more anxious, stressed or fearful than usual, hearing things, seeing things or feeling strange, and encourage them to immediately stop drug use and seek help to reduce the risk of a full-blown episode, and inform the client that the use of AOD can make prescribed medications for psychosis ineffective. So we're moving on to um, managing symptoms of personality disorders. Clients with personality disorders have frequent and enduring problems in coping and interpersonal interaction. So symptoms of personality disorders, some of which I have on screen here, are often present to varying degrees in many clients and do not necessarily indicate a personality disorder, but they can make the therapeutic process more difficult. Some of these personality characteristics, impulsivity in particular, can place clients at extremely high risk for suicide. So it's therefore really important to monitor the risk of suicide and self-harm. Assisting clients develop skills um, to manage negative emotions is also important. Clients with personality disorders tend to have difficulty forming genuinely positive therapeutic alliances. They tend to frame reality in terms of their own needs and perceptions and not understand those of others. So they can also be limited in their ability to receive, accept or benefit from corrective feedback. So therefore progress is likely to be slow and uneven. So engagement and rapport building is a really critical part of therapy and clients with personality disorders might require more time and attention than other clients. Clients with personality disorders can also, may also have trouble engaging in therapy, sorry, in treatment due to a history of poor relationships with health professionals, a bias towards suspiciousness or paranoid interpretation of relationships or a chaotic lifestyle and all of which can make appointment scheduling and engagement in structured work more difficult. So structure and firm boundaries are really important components of the therapeutic process when managing clients with symptoms of personality disorders. Some techniques that can help workers manage clients with symptoms of personality disorders are here for you to come back to. Before I move on to management of symptoms of ADHD. 
So ADHD represents a persistent pattern of developmentally inappropriate level of um, inattention, hyperactivity, and or impulsivity. So the evidence um, suggests that attentional difficulties are more likely to persist into adulthood, while impulsivity and hyperactivity tend to be the ones that diminish over time. Adult symptoms um, are expressed differently to the way in which they're expressed in, ch in childhood, and they may include difficulties with time management, disorganization, procrastination, lack of motivation, difficulty sleeping, irritability, frustration or anger, fatigue, difficulties concentrating or studying, um, and this might present as academic underachievement, occupational workplace difficulties, problems forming or maintaining relationships, difficulty obtaining or and or maintaining stable employment, as well as a history of imprisonment or frequent contact with police. So in addition, clients can also present with other symptoms which are not unique to ADHD, but are common to lots of different mental disorders like problems sleeping, irritability, and fatigue. People diagnosed with ADHD in adulthood might require additional psychosocial support, which can help them come to terms with their diagnosis and reframe their past. And again, some techniques that can help workers manage symptoms of ADHD are here for you to come back to. So managing symptoms of OCD. Person with OCD may be significantly distressed by their symptoms and their ability to function may be impaired. So they can be plagued by persistent thoughts or impulses that are intrusive and unwanted or called obsessions. And they may feel compelled to perform repetitive ritualistic actions that are, that are excessive and time consuming or compulsions. So symptoms of obsessions might include fear of germs, dirt or poisons, harm from illness or injury to self or others, um, intrusive thoughts about sex or sexual acts, excessive concerns with symmetry or orderliness, needing to know or remember things, and hoarding or saving and collecting things. So a person can feel annoyed, discomforted, distressed, or panic about their obsessions and feel driven to perform repetitive mental or physical acts in response. The symptoms of compulsions can include excessive hand washing, showering or toothbrushing, excessively checking locks, appliances, or other safety items, repeating activities or routines, applying rules to the placements of objects, and an inability to throw out excessive collections of items. OCD can often go underdetected among people with AOD conditions, and this is thought to be due both to a lack of training among people who work with comorbidity or comorbid clients in the detection of OCD, but also a lack of disclosure by clients who may experience shame and embarrassment and be intent on hiding their symptoms. So many people can have mild symptoms that are associated with stressful life events or situations. These will often improve without the need for specific treatments. But for those who experience the severity, distress and impairment, which is, which is associated with more chronic and enduring OCD, and they may benefit from some form of treatment. And again, some techniques that can help workers manage clients with obsessive compulsive disorders are here for you to come back to. So managing symptoms of eating disorders. When talking about eating disorders, I'm referring to anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, and binge eating disorder, which frequently co-occur with AOD use. So the co-occurrence of eating disorders and AOD use is particularly complex and challenging in terms of assessment and treatment, the associated physical health complications, and also the potential negative cognitive impacts of both disorders. So assessment can be made even more difficult by a tendency of people with eating disorders to minimize or deny symptoms due to a deliberate deception or a genuine lack of self-awareness. But it's so important that this comorbidity is identified because of the severity of the consequences of comorbid eating disorder and AOD use, including the potential medical complications, the additional severe psychiatric comorbidities, suicidal ideation and attempts, as well as mortality. So it's vital for healthcare workers to be able to recognize the clinical and sub-threshold signs of eating disorder and have some knowledge about simple management strategies. Eating disorders are characterized by disturbances in eating behaviors, as well as food intake that impair psychosocial functioning and or physical health. So this can involve food restriction, so limiting the amount of food eaten each day by reducing portion size, eliminating food types like fats or carbohydrates or not eating at all, vomiting and purging, over-exercising or binge eating, which is consuming an objectively large amount of food in a short period of time, which is accompanied by a feeling um, or a sense of a feeling out of control. The majority of the physical symptoms associated with eating disorders are related to the effects of starvation, but they can also be due to the effects of binging, purging, or over-exercising. People with eating disorders, and particularly bulimia nervosa, 
can show few outward signs of their disorder, and any visible physical signs might be complicated by any AOD use. So for example, AOD use can influence features that are usually associated with the assessment of eating disorder, such as weight, appetite, and food restriction. And people with an eating disorder can also experience eating-related symptoms, which are similar to those associated with AOD use, like cravings and patterns of compulsive use. So the level of care required will be dependent on illness severity, the presence of any medical complications, the dangerousness of behaviours, as well as any other psychiatric comorbidities like depression or anxiety. So healthcare workers should also be aware of any potential interplay between the eating disorder and AOD use and really keep this in mind when conducting assessments. So for example, there can be AOD use related to the eating disorder. For example, the use of tobacco, stimulants, diet pills, laxatives, diuretics or caffeine to control weight or suppress appetite. So um, assessment should include a focus on the use of AOD as a weight loss mechanism, as well as the role it might have in emotion regulation. There are, of course, lots of differences between eating disorders, and I'm not going to go into that level of detail tonight, except to say that despite these differences in terms of clinical characteristics and observable symptoms, there are some strategies that healthcare workers can use to manage these disorders. The general principles of managing and treating eating disorders should include the establishment of a trusting, collaborative, therapeutic relationship, which um, takes, and really taking care, not, sorry, taking care to avoid any potential power struggles. So some techniques that can help workers manage clients with symptoms of eating disorders um, are here to come back to. So I'll just come back to Michelle before moving on um, to treatment. So after Michelle had made contact with a drop-in medical centre and received immediate medical care for her injuries, she decided to see a counsellor at the centre. So using assessment procedures that we described in the last webinar, her counsellor identified that Michelle was likely experiencing depression, anxiety and trauma-related symptoms. She went through a number of different techniques to help Michelle manage her symptoms on a day-to-day -day basis. In particular, Michelle found that controlled breathing and grounding exercises were helpful for her trauma and anxiety symptoms, and she began monitoring her mood and cognitions. In addition, she began trying to do something nice for herself each day, such as going for a swim in the park, sorry, a walk in the park, I'm going for the beach, going to the beach for a swim. So I just wanted to summarise the key points from what we've covered so far before moving on. Comorbid mental health symptoms can be managed and controlled while a client undergoes treatment. Be sure to monitor suicide risk throughout treatment. Motivational enhancement, simple CBT strategies, relaxation and grounding techniques can be useful in managing AOD use as well as mental health conditions. So moving on to the next part of our webinar tonight, which is how do we treat comorbidity? But before um, really jumping in, I wanted to ask a poll question of everybody watching the live webinar. I'm sorry, if you're watching a recorded webinar um, later, you won't be able to vote in the live poll, but you can write down your answer. Um, I'd like to ask you all out there. One second, sorry. Um, which of the following has some evidence for the treatment of... Um, mental health disorders. So you can choose as many of these or as few as you like. At least one of them is right. Um, or I think one of them is right. <laughs> Do you think that there's evidence for psychological interventions, pharmacological interventions, e-health, physical exercise, complementary and alternative therapies, um, all of the above or none of the above? So you can um, click as many as you like. I'll just leave it open for like another 10 seconds. Okay, great. Thank you. If you answered all of the above, you're right. <laughs> so there is some evidence um, for all of these approaches. And of course, many of you watching um, might be more familiar with the more traditional psychological and pharmacological approaches, but I'll be talking a bit more about e-health, physical exercise and complementary and alternative therapies as we move through. So in terms of treatment for comorbidity, there's a lot more research that's needed before definitive practices can be prescribed. This is largely because people with AOD disorders are commonly excluded from trials of psychotherapies and pharmacotherapy for mental health disorders. So many recommendations are largely based on expert opinion rather than evidence from research. But in general, it can be concluded that treatments that work for a single disorder will lead to some improvements in comorbid clients, if not in both disorders. 
Some interventions have been designed for the treatment of specific comorbidities, but in general, they haven't been well researched. So in the absence of specific research on comorbidities, it's general recommend, generally recommended that the best practice is to use the most effective treatment for single disorders or for each disorder. So in terms of clients AOD use, the goal of abstinence is usually favoured, particularly for people whose mental health conditions are exacerbated by AOD use. Abstinence is also preferred for those with more severe mental health disorders or cognitive impairment, as even low level substance use can be problematic. Those taking medications for mental health conditions, for example, antipsychotics, antidepressants or mood stabilizers, can also find they become intoxicated even at low levels of AOD use due to the interactions between drugs. So although abstinence is favored, many people with comorbidity prefer a goal of moderation. And in order to successfully engage with the client, healthcare workers should really accommodate a range of treatment goals and adopt a harm reduction approach. It's also important to remember that a lapse in AOD use isn't necessarily a relapse. Lapses are a normal part of the process of recovery and don't necessarily mean a person is where they were before. So if a lapse is identified early enough, a relapse can be prevented. Early in the webinar, I said we would be talking about the management and treatment of comorbidity from a holistic health perspective. What I mean by that is really being mindful of the whole person. So being aware that complex problems experienced by people with comorbidity um, mean that it's so important to treat the person and not the illness. So the goal of any service and any healthcare worker should really be to improve the quality of life across all domains, including health, social welfare and housing, employment, criminal justice, and of course, AOD and mental health. So in terms of approaches to comorbidity, there are four main models of care, which is sequential treatment, which is when the client is treated for one condition first, which is usually AOD use, which is then followed by the treatment for the other condition, which is usually the mental health problem. Parallel treatment, which is when the, both the client's AOD use and mental health condition are treated simultaneously, but they're provided independently of each other. Integrated treatment, which is when the AOD use and mental health condition are treated simultaneously by the same treatment provider or service. And stepped care, which is the flexible matching of treatment intensity to case severity. So the least intensive and expensive treatment is usually um, offered first, and then clients are stepped up to a more intensive and or expensive treatment only if the initial treatment is insufficient. So I'm going to ask another poll question here. Um, got to multitask. So which model of care do you think is the best for treating co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders? Do you think sequential treatment, parallel treatment, integrated treatment, or stepped care is the best? So I'll just leave this open for um, the 10, 15 seconds. Keep them coming. Uh, another five seconds. Great. Thank you. Okay, that's really cool. Um, so the answer <laughs> is we don't really know. <laughs> so um, sequential treatment is really the one that's the most often used, but actually there's really little evidence or little research available to determine which models may suit which comorbidities. And workers may need to make pragmatic decisions about which model is most appropriate for individual clients. But for those of you who said integrated treatment, um, you know, that's, I think that's really good because it has considerable intuitive appeal and it presents a lot of advantages over other treatment approaches, including a single point of contact. So the client doesn't fall through the gaps. There are common objectives. The treatment is internally consistent. The relationship between AOD use and mental health conditions can be explored and communication problems between agencies doesn't interfere with treatment. So although the research is limited in this space, there is emerging evidence to suggest that integrated treatments might be superior to parallel or sequential treatments in terms of improving outcomes. So, you know, I guess the answer is stay tuned. So for the most part, both psychological and pharmacological interventions have been found to have some benefit. And it's recommended that when pharmacotherapy is used, it should be accompanied by supportive psychological interventions with healthcare workers aware of the potential interactions between medications and other substances. Symptoms are less likely to return on completion of psychological treatment compared to pharmacotherapy, where relapse upon cessation is quite common. But having said that, some clients may be better able to respond to psychological interventions if they're taking pharmacotherapies. 
When prescribing medications for people with comorbidity, it's important to take into account any possible interaction effects between prescribed and non-prescribed substances, the possible presence of medical problems such as liver dysfunction related to long-term AOD use or hepatitis, um, the abuse potential of any medications prescribed, as well as strategies which can improve compliance. There are a number of psychological approaches that are commonly used in the treatment of many mental health disorders, which include motivational interviewing, cognitive behavioural therapy, realised prevention techniques, psychosocial groups, self-help groups, mindfulness training and contingency management. It should be noted, though, that it may be necessary for a substantial reduction in substance use and withdrawal symptoms to occur before more intensive psychotherapies can be effective. So in addition to the more traditional psychological and pharmacological approaches, e-health interventions, physical activity, as well as complementary and alternative therapies may also be considered in developing a person's treatment plan. So I've put a brief summary of some of the available treatments for depressive disorder on screen here. I have this summary up here for all of the disorders. I really just want to emphasize this is a, a really quick at a glance overview, and it can't capture many of the complexities involved in treating all of the disorders that I'm going to talk about. So several um, psychological, pharmacological and alternative approaches for co-occurring depression and, and AOD use disorders appear promising, but further research is needed to establish which approaches are particularly effective. Clinical efforts should focus on providing client-centered, evidence-based treatment, which can take into account the client's needs and preferences in a collaborative partnership. In general, there's a lack of research for both psychological and pharmacological treatments for comorbid anxiety and AOD use disorders, and the evidence for integrated treatment is mixed. As with depression, most or much of the anxiety experienced by clients um, entering treatment will subside following a period of abstinence and stabilization without the need for any direct intervention. Um, despite their proven efficacy in relieving anxiety, the use of benzodiazepines isn't recommended due to their abuse liability. Several psychological and pharmacological approaches for the treatment of co-occurring bipolar disorder and AOD use appear promising, but further research is needed to establish which therapeutic approaches are particularly effective. Due to the interrelatedness of PTSD and AOD use, an integrated approach to the treatment of these disorders is recommended. So although several psychotherapeutic interventions have been developed for comorbid PTSD and AOD use, few have been rigorously evaluated. So the evidence to date suggests that individual past-focused psycholog psychological interventions delivered alongside AOD treatment show the most promise, but there's little evidence to support the use of present-focused individual or group-based interventions. So findings from pharmaceutical trials suggest that pharmacotherapies, and in particular SSRIs, may be a useful adjunctive treatment if sufficient benefit has not been gained from psychological interventions. And there's also some support for e-health interventions, physical exercise, and yoga. In general, if a person is well maintained on medication for their psychotic disorder, management for AOD use can proceed as usual. People with comorbid psychotic spectrum and AOD use disorder should have the opportunity to participate and make informed choices about their treatment in consultation with and sorry, in consultation and partnership with their healthcare providers. So when planning treatment, workers should take into account the severity of both disorders, the individual social and treatment context, as well as their readiness to change. There's no one-size-fits-all approach for treating this comorbidity or really any of the comorbidities, and combinations of different therapeutic approaches may be necessary for each individual person. And in addition, therapist flexibility is so important for the treatment of this group. In regards to personality disorders, the research is really focused primarily on borderline personality disorder or BPD, and there's a lack of research available to help guide clinicians in the treatment of comorbid antisocial personality disorder or ASPD and AOD use. So the first line of treatment for those with comorbid BPD and AOD use should be psychotherapy, and there have been several interventions specifically developed for this group. Similarly, psychological intervention should be the first line of treatment for ASPD um, and AOD use, but the evidence is less well developed. Without evidentiary support, pharmacotherapy is not recommended for the treatment of either comorbid BPD and AOD use or ASPD and AOD use. In general, the treatment for comorbid ADHD and AOD use should use an integrated multimodal approach with components of individual and or group psychotherapy, as well as family and peer support, which can enhance um, the effects of treatment. 
So the evidence suggests that combined approaches in, a corp in incorporating both psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy interventions have better outcomes than pharmacotherapy alone, and the use of structured psychotherapies, including CBT, that focuses on goals with active health worker involvement is likely to be the most beneficial. And as with the treatment of other comorbidities, treating both conditions concurrently is more likely to produce a positive treatment outcome than treating either disorder alone. Although there's little evidence regarding the treatment of co-occurring AOD use and OCD, the existing evidence suggests that treating both OCD and AOD use leads to better treatment outcomes than treating AOD use alone. While there's limited evidence for the treatment of comorbid OCD and AOD use, results from single disorder OCD studies suggest there's strong and consistent evidence to recommend the use of exposure and response prevention, or ERP, or CBT, as the first line of treatment in single disorder OCD. The treatment for comorbid eating disorders and AOD use should be provided using an integrated approach, which can minimize the potential for dis, um, deterioration in one disorder as symptoms of the other disorder improve. So although there's um, several treatment options available for the treatment of eating disorders alone, including psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, e-health interventions, physical activity, and complementary and alternative therapies, there's little definitive evidence that can provide clear guidance for this comorbidity. Research that looked at eating disorders as a single disorder suggests that psychotherapy should be the first line of treatment. And although there's a little bit of evidence that um, pharmacotherapy can be a useful adjunct to the treatment of single disorder eating disorders, the evidence is not conclusive and Australian clinical guidelines do not recommend its use in the absence of psychotherapy. So again, I know that I've just thrown a whole bunch of information at you and I'm sorry, <laughs> you can go back and have a look at it when you have time. Um, just to summarize the key points from treatment before moving on, good treatment requires a good therapeutic alliance. Some interventions have been designed for the treatment of specific comorbidities, but in general, these haven't been well researched. In the absence of specific research on comorbid disorders, it's generally recommended that the best practice is to use the most effective treatment for each disorder. In some cases, this can be carried out at the same time for most disorders, but in others, it has to be carefully calibrated. Both psychological, sorry, both psychosocial and pharmacological interventions have been found to have some benefit in the treatment of many comorbidities. And when pharmacotherapy is used, it should be accompanied by supportive psychosocial interventions. And there's some evidence that supports the use of e-health interventions, physical activity, and complementary and alternative therapies for some comorbid disorders. So the final section that I wanted to cover tonight is the referral pathways. So there are often times when clinicians refer clients to external workers or services. As I mentioned earlier on in the webinar, one of the biggest risks in the referral, to client, the referral of clients to external services is the potential of clients to fall through the gaps and disappear from treatment altogether. As a result of this, people can be bounced between mental health and AOD services with little continuity or coordination of care and can end up falling between the cracks in our healthcare system. So people with comorbidity often have difficulty navigating their way through the available services, which can be really difficult to access even when you're well, um, with multiple entry points and multiple options of treatment pathways, agencies, and healthcare providers. It's therefore really critical for care coordination and the referral process to focus on linking clients in with services as smoothly as possible. So the development of formal links between services regarding consultation, Referral pathways and collaboration can help with this process. In fact, coordinated care increases the likelihood that clients will receive specialised assistance where it's needed and facilitates client engagement in treatment. Evidence has linked coordinated care with improved treatment outcomes, prolonged client retention, increased treatment satisfaction, improved quality of life and increased use of community-based services. Where referral is not urgent and urgent medical or psychiatric attention is not needed, the referral process can be passive facilitated or active. So I won't go into detail about these except to say that the, in the case of clients with comorbid conditions, active referral is recommended over passive or facilitated referral. So to give a summary of all of the information that we've covered tonight, AOD and mental health disorders are common. Clients with comorbid mental health conditions often have a variety of other medical, family and social problems, so it's really important to adopt a holistic approach in the management and treatment of comorbidity that's based on treating the person and not the illness. Although some interventions have been designed for the treatment of specific comorbidities, in general they haven't been well researched, so in the absence of specific research on comorbid disorders, it's generally recommended that the best practice is to use the most effective treatment for each disorder. 
In addition to mental health services, health workers may need to engage with a range of other services to meet their clients' needs, including housing, employment, education, training, community, justice, and other support services. So just to come back to Michelle, her counsellor talked um, with Michelle about some different treatment options and they looked into them together. Michelle decided she would like to try a women's specific rehabilitation program and starting off with detoxification. She was attracted to it in particular because it was a women's only service. They adopted a trauma informed care approach and it also had the option for her to undergo trauma specific um, treatment if she wanted to, but they didn't push her to if she wasn't ready. So she was on a wait list for a short time, then got into the service. And while she was there, she had a comprehensive assessment of her physical health. After being there for a while, Michelle's caseworker began helping her make plans for her discharge, including her accommodation and looking into some TAFE courses. So the key points to take from Michelle's case study are, it's important to provide the client with options regarding management and treatment of their co-occurring mental health and substance use problems and work within a collaborative therapeutic, um, therapeutic partnership. Consider holistic healthcare approaches, but obviously understand that not all approaches will suit everybody and be mindful of the need to consider trauma-informed care. And again, I just wanted to emphasize that despite the comorbidity um, being common, the barriers to care and the difficulties involved in managing and treating people with these complex conditions, people can and they do get better. So I just want to thank everybody for having joined us for this webinar and for sticking with me through this onslaught of information. If you're interested in viewing this or other webinar recordings, these can be viewed via the CREMS website. Um, to complete the CPD assessment that's attached to this webinar, you can click on the link on this slide and remember to submit your responses. You can also join us at the next and the final webinar, which is um, uh, yeah, the final in this series, which is going to focus on managing the physical health of people with comorbidity, and that'll be on the 5th of December. And more webinar topics can, will also be covered through the CREMS webinar series. If you're interested in any of these, you can subscribe to our mailing list, which is on this slide here. Thanks, Chris. Wow, a lot of information. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. Um, and uh, there was just a question throughout as well about um, where to access um, the resources that you've mentioned. So um, I'll just mention here as well that all of the material is covered in the second edition of the National Comorbidity Guidelines, which um, Chris led, which you can download from um, the comorbidity.edu.au website or order hard copies directly from Chris. Is that right? Chris? That's right, yes. And there is a, um, I did have a link, I think, in one of the earlier slides to download the PDF. Um, so you can do that as well if you right. can't wait. And also, just a plug as well, I think, for um, that you've recently, um, or you're very close to launching an online training program, aren't you, that covers all this management and treatment material as well? Yes, so there's an online training program that we've developed for um, health workers in. Yes, I guess identifying, managing, treating, hopefully everything you want to know about comorbidity. Um, that we're close to launching. We're just waiting for the final approvals. Um, if you're interested in that, you can find more about it on those links I've provided. Um, you can subscribe to be notified once it's finished. Awesome. And um, just we just have a couple of minutes, so I'll run through a few quick questions that we got. Um, just uh, you mentioned um, during the talk that there are a range of different treatment options. Um, so like the psychological, pharmacological, e-health, um, and some alternative therapies as well and physical activity. Do you think that clinicians are actually aware of those and, but, and also the community are aware that there are that sort of range of options that people can look at? Um, I think that's, you know, a really important question. I think um, clinicians and probably people in the community are more likely to be aware of the more traditional psychological and pharmacological treatments that are available but just and maybe that's in part due to that's just sort of been in the last few years there's been more evidence that come out that's come out supporting the use of e-health physical activity and um, complementary and alternative therapies and I guess with treating other medical conditions like um, you know diabetes and heart disease not all approaches are going to suit everybody which is why we were so keen to incorporate you know e-health physical activity and complementary alternative therapy so there is you know a broader range mm. yeah and I, I guess I'm uh, thinking on that as well that it's also about raising community awareness mm. about what treatments are available so that people can feel empowered I guess to, to visit their healthcare practitioner and ask about um, what's yeah about. where they can access them or where they can find more information yeah 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 definitely um, 
And also you, you discussed the different models of care um, and in, including the integrated approaches. Um, a lot of people often think though that you need to treat the, a person's substance use before treating their mental health condition. Um, is that true? <laughs> um, I guess I think one of the good things about the management strategies that we talked about, you know, in this webinar is that you don't, um, or I guess, you know, ideally, 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 yes, you'd be abstinent, but in practice that can be really difficult. Um, for people to maintain abstinence when they're experiencing symptoms of their mental health disorder, particularly if they're using them to help them relieve or cope with their mental health symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why treating, I guess, both the substance use and mental health disorder at the same time in an integrated way is so important. So if you're treating one, the symptoms of the other don't get worse. Um, and you know, that's why management strategies, I think, is quite, are quite useful in that respect. Um, so although, you know, people might not get the maximum benefit from therapy if they're still using substances, just in terms of the optimal um, dose, they can still benefit. And it's really important to work within their stage of change wherever they're ready. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that, that, that's a really important point, I think, is that just because it might be a bit more difficult um, mm. or perhaps progress won't be as rapid, people can still, as you said, get benefit from, from doing those treatments. And I, I guess also maybe potentially move along in their stage of change. Like even if they might not want to start off with an uh, abstinence-based focus, maybe they'll move on to it um, through treatment. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, today again. And just as a reminder, the last seminar on physical health uh, and co-occurring mental and substance use disorders will be on the 5th of uh, December and I uh, hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you.